With COVID-19 vaccines now available, there's more optimism despite the lingering pandemic. The new normal has also sparked a stronger emphasis on social responsibility amongst corporations and individuals. Making sustainable investing, which incorporates environmental, social and corporate governance, key to investment decisions. It's a remodeled world with big wins and risks. Hi there, I'm Stephen Chia, and with me, an expert panel to discover those investment opportunities on Market Insights. Discovering opportunities in a remodeled world was the theme of UOB's privileged conversations, examining the market outlook for 2021 after a tumultuous year, setting the stage with how businesses and economies are reinventing themselves amidst a global pandemic, UOB's Head of Wealth Management Advisory and Strategy, Mr Abel Lip. Markets has recovered tremendously well since the lows of March last year. This is a result of a heady concoction of vaccine being developed, and distributed globally. Government and central bank policies and stimulus has been supportive of the economies. Low interest rates has helped support companies and individuals to stay buoyant during this very difficult period. The US presidential election is now behind us and there's more certainty on what to look forward to. We now see a K-shaped recovery. Companies that are involved in pharmaceutical, technology, e-commerce and also in the gaming world has had significant tailwinds and they will continue to be well supported this year. Travel, hospitality and also the entertainment have borne the brunt of the COVID lockdown. But as vaccines are beginning to roll out globally and we see more traction, we think that a rotation trade might be happening in the near future. By 2050, some 16% of the global population will be 65 years and above. That is a significant number. Why this is so? They are also the biggest spender in the healthcare arena. What COVID-19 has done is that it has accelerated many trends and many innovations. Telemedicine has grown six-folds over this entire period. Unemployment continues to remain relatively high at this current juncture. Both demand and supply chains were devastated during the COVID crisis. A lot of these permanent damages may not be reversed. Whilst things have improved, we are looking at some of the factors that continue to plague us. The ageing population is one of them. Weak demand resulting in a lack of funding and investment in the technological space is now impeding some of the technological advances and its effects. COVID has also showed up some of the weaknesses and our dependency on other countries. Hence, nearshoring and onshoring of a lot of facilities is likely to push up costs, introduce inflation and ultimately productivity. The global debt stands at $277 trillion. 90% of that debt sits in the United States, Asia and in Europe. If 2013 was a sign, the taper tantrum is likely to be a lot worse. Can you imagine a global tantrum? All right, Abel, thanks so much for giving us this insight. But we're going to get the discussion going and start off with a look at sustainable investing. Morris, this question for you. Questions have been raised of a lack of standardization in data gathering and methodologies, and also the difficulties in detecting greenwashing by companies. So how then can investors get reliable information? For the last couple of years, the holy grail was to have access to good data on sustainability. I think now there's more information available and the true value add really lies into the interpretation of the data. The Rubico approach is really to first look what is material and that will differ sector by sector, company by company. And then we analyze that and we look to quantify. Quantify in terms of what is the real impact on expected financial returns. And you see that in 27% of cases that we actually see that the sustainability information add something additional and differs, uh, alters our opinion about that company. That is how relevant sustainability data is today. Environmental, social, governance factors. How would Asian investors fare against investors worldwide when it comes to allocating uh, their assets along ESG? I think um, despite and also because of the rapid growth in Asia, um, ESG has actually kind of not taken precedence. Asia 
contributes only about 5% vis-a-vis the rest of the world. The main uh, reason why a government exists is to provide uh, employment uh, for their citizens to be able to grow GDP and per capita for, for the, 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 the citizens. Environmental and social issues tend to take a back seat. Now that also leads to the next point, which is the lack of knowledge and a lack of awareness. Because these individuals are less exposed to the ideology behind the ESG and why it's important. And that's the reason you're seeing why the demand for such assets are low. In Asia, many businesses continue to belong to singular or a small handful of very wealthy families. And because of this, the pressure to abide by or to follow ESG factors tend to be less prevalent and less obvious or less urgent. But things are changing. Um, the millennials are pushing quite hard on this agenda and we are also seeing uh, positive steps from the PBOC and also MAS who have recently rolled out green financial initiatives to sustain or to support ESG. As you mentioned, the number is quite low now, but if more companies in Asia did look into improving their ESG, you know, I mean, what do you think this would mean for the growth of consumer markets here in Asia? I think it's, there's a huge opportunity for, for Asian investors, um, particularly from a very low base to start off with. Um, the United Nations Development Goals has, is worth about $12 trillion over the next couple of years, of which $5 trillion of those initiatives can actually be found in Asia. So that represents a lot of opportunities. If we, I strip away the acronym ESG, if you see a company that is well-governed, transparent, has its um, uh, goals aligned with stakeholders, particular shareholders, embraces um, racial and gender diversity, allowing and attracting top talents from around the world and allowing them to perform and rise to the top, creating a very cohesive and working environment, why wouldn't you want to invest in that company? If there was a company that cares for its environment, looks at resources and not waste them, and at the same time avoids legality, be it uh, reputational, be it legal battles, and, and the process uh, contributing to the bottom line and avoid reputational risk, why would you want to in not invest in this company? Mm -hmm. So I feel that if you apply ESG factors on some of these companies, it serves as a ruler or, or, or benchmark for you to identify future quality companies that you should or want to include in your portfolio. George, I've got a question for you because uh, we know COVID, the pandemic is still very much around us. So we have a few vaccines out now. How do you think that has changed the healthcare sector? Is it still ripe for the investment or is it too late now the vaccine is out? There's been two key headwinds in this market. The first one has been COVID essentially has disrupted that market. You know, procedures have been delayed. Um, the expenditure on equipment has been delayed. A lot of that is gradually, but it is subsiding. Another headwind has been the political um, sort of sphere, especially in the US, where there was a risk at some point that you know, we might end up having material um, uh, reforms in the healthcare uh, space. That risk has, again, meaningfully subsided. And at the same time, if you look at valuations, they're not too demanding. So that's important. And if you look at positioning, again, not too excessive. And Abel earlier on showed some statistics on the aging population. Now, this is a very structural tailwind for this market. Now, what I would suggest in this space is there are some you know, really good pockets of opportunity, for instance, diagnostics and also life sciences. As economies start buzzing again, Market Insights explores the recovery plays that our panelists are eyeing. Very attractive real yields, very attractive um, nominal yields is very much underowned, and inflation is not particularly a concern. If anything, it's fighting disinflationary forces. What is that market? Kunha, this next question for you, because I, I mean, with the talk of vaccines, you know, when they first came in, I mean, it was a real shot in the arm, pun the pun, you know, <laughs> but it, it helped the economy recover to a certain extent. But yet, Experts are predicting that there will be a slump for the US dollar. So what is your outlook for the greenback? So, you know, uh, it is very, very you know, exciting to expect that if things do work well, economies recover, you will expect the US dollar to recover. But our studies show that, you know, all the fundamental drivers are still pointing to a weaker dollar. And primarily, you know, the biggest so-called driver that shows that the dollar should be weak is the big explosion in US money supply. It's a necessary evil now for money supply to be you know, very expensive because you need to tie across the difficult period during COVID-19. But the consequence is you have a weaker dollar. We look at the US dollar index. So this is a multi-year support. 
it looks like the dollar index may break below the magical 90 number. If the dollar is weak, renminbi is strong because of stronger Chinese economy. So that means it's our local currency, the Singapore dollar, will likely be strong as well. We see dollar sing grinding lower from 133 now towards about 130 by the second half of the year. With the vaccines around, I mean, George, uh, do you think that has also spurred on other sectors? Where else should investors be looking to put their money? Well, with vaccine, that means opening up economies. And when I think about that, under cyclical sectors, I think banks. Because what's happened in the past one year, banks have been under a lot of pressure. Big concerns about future NPLs rising. One area that I, I think is very exciting is banks in Singapore where NIMS are not going to go um, higher from here because yields are going to be lower for a long while, but at the same time expect volume um, to rise when it comes to, to loan generation. Um, balance sheets for the banks are a lot stronger versus where they were back in the global financial crisis. Valuations on a price-to-book basis are almost at the same levels as the global financial crisis. And if you look at Singapore and, and the broader Singapore um, uh, market, you've got banks and, re and REITs, real estate investment trusts, dominating that market. That's another very interesting sort of recovery play because, again, benefits from low interest rates. Those two together, two-thirds of the economy, and you get around a 4% yield, which I'm sure investors are quite excited about. There's been a strong rise in 10-year US Treasury yields. So what's happening there and, and what is your forecast going forward? Is that inflation horizon? Now, clearly there's no inflation, you know, as far as the eye can see, because we still need quite some time for the global economy to recover. So one big reason why U.S. Treasury yield is higher is because the market is starting to appreciate the significant rise in debt. The U.S. government debt level, it was around 22 trillion U.S. dollar pre-COVID. That's jumped to about 28 trillion U.S. dollar. And if President Joe Biden does push forth his you know, 1.9, 2 over trillion of stimulus, which the U.S. needs desperately, you know, the amount of U.S. Treasury debt outstanding will balloon to just under $30 trillion. Do not be afraid of the rise in long-term bond yield as long as it's gradual, as long as it's manageable. It is you know, a healthy rise to reflect you know, the slightly more in-depthness of all the economies in the US and all across the world. Mm -hmm. It appears that the investment landscape could be challenging in 2021 for fixed income. How do you think investors should adjust their fixed income portfolios? The market seems to mainly price in the more rosy scenarios, uh, positive growth, inflation uh, remaining low. Um, but we would advise to also account for more negative outcomes, just like we saw last year. Uh, the market was clearly not prepared for that kind of a downturn. Think of the liquidity positions in your portfolio. Be a bit more conservative. Uh, focus on the quality and um, the importance of sustainability. Uh, take into account the sustainability of your portfolio because it does tend to reduce the downside risk. So be prepared for surprises. That would be our advice. There is one um, uh, government bond market that actually provides very attractive real yields, very attractive um, nominal yields, is very much underowned, and inflation is not particularly a concern. If anything, it's fighting disinflationary forces like the rest of the world. What is that market? It's Chinese government bonds. And we think that should increasingly play a bigger part in your portfolios. And then you can match that up with, with other, you know, Asia high yield, for instance, very attractive yields, attractive valuations and fundamentals, pretty fairly resilient compared to other parts of the economy. Basically, you know, 10-year Chinese governments pay around 3%. So even if 10-year US treasuries rise to 1.2, 1.3, that gap is significant. So, so I'm with George there, you know, that you differentiate is very attractive for you seekers. Next, opportunities in ASEAN with the RCEP trade agreement. Many of the concerns buying from um, emerging nations are being addressed through this pact. Whoever has capacity and whoever has, uh, has the skill set that can grow. But if I was to pick just one country, I would go with. Are there still pockets of opportunities that we can look to invest in, or perhaps industries that we had deemed COVID-19 losers? On Singapore's context, uh, number one, I wouldn't call that losers. I think they're laggards. Okay. <laughs> now, the good news about Singapore is that we are relatively small. It's quite easy for us to vaccinate the entire nation quite effectively, given the logistical uh, possibility um, that, that, that behoves. Secondly, China is actually coming back in a very, very big way. That is 
definitely positive for Asia, particularly in Singapore. As such, I think some of these industries that are um, um, exporting to China that continues to plug into the global system is likely to stage a recovery later part of 2021. I think borders will continue to be pretty much close to most people. So the tourism and the hospitality and the aviation industry is likely to be continued challenge. Um, personally, I'm actually leaning more towards retail and more specifically the e-commerce space. The e-commerce space is likely to grow by another 3 trillion over the course of the next two years, bringing that to $6.5 trillion. That's a huge number uh, for it to grow. And this is largely going to be driven by Asia. The smart device penetration in Asia is one of the highest in the world. And at the same time, today, we are seeing that nearly 40 to 50% of online purchases is being done by the smartphone, the one that you're holding in your hand right now. ASEAN members in five countries signed the ASEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Uh, which three ASEAN countries stand to benefit the most from this agreement during a post-pandemic recovery and why? If you look at uh, China's imports coming from ASEAN, um, a few years back, it was under 10%. It's already grown to 13 14%. So quite meaningful increase there. And to be honest, all of them should benefit. You know, if you look at Malaysia, for instance, they create solar panels. And China has have a big agenda. If you look at the, the last plan, a big agenda on turning more green. Um, Thailand, another, another sort of uh, country that has um, a production sort of um, uh, network on, on the electric side, electronic side, um, hard, hard disk drivers essentially, whoever has capacity and whoever has, uh, has the skill set that can grow. But if I was to pick just one country, I would go with Vietnam. And the reason for that is, again, electronics, newcomer in, in that market, but growing very, very fast, has very much been helped by investment coming from Korean companies, but also automotive parts, a growing part of the market, um, growing sort of part of the, of, of the market share, and again, growing rapidly there. Wages have been rising, and that might make it a less attractive destination. But let's also not forget that wage rising is a good thing for that economy, so it's benefiting directly. And at the same time, they might be ri rising, but they're still competitive, both in the region and also globally. Can I just add, this focuses on a few things. Number one, inter lecture property right uh, protection, quality uh, assurance, amongst other things, and, and, and also uh, on a legal standpoint. So, so many of the concerns buying from um, emerging nations are being addressed through this pack. What do you think about crude oil? Will that rebound further? And also gold, what's happened with that? Most of the commodity indices in general have recovered more or less to pre-COVID levels. Crude oil is now around $50 per barrel or slightly higher. A lot of it depends on this very fragile alliance between OPEC, Saudi Arabia, and Russia. So as long as they keep their act in order, they don't pump excessive crude oil before the world's economy really recovers, before we control COVID-19, then I think crude oil should be quite stable around the $50 to $60 per barrel range. Now for gold, gold has been disappointing. You have COVID-19, people can't get married, so nobody buys the gold bangles, nobody buys the necklaces, so on and so forth. So if you believe that you know, the world will be a better place in the second half of the year, the demand for gold jewelry will come back. So when that happens, we will expect gold to come back up to the $2,000 per ounce level or higher. We want to go full circle and go back to that question on sustainable investing. Given mm -hmm. the current rate of climate change, what do you think are some sectors that are potential investment winners? Indeed, there are also very specific investment opportunities, whether it relates to clean energy, or the electrification of transportation, for example, there is a massive opportunity in green bonds, for example. So financing the transition towards a cleaner economy. And this is really picking up in terms of attention for investors. How do we show that ESG actually really makes a difference to these companies? Yeah, what we can really see, um, and again, I refer to risk return, is that looking at ESG information, using that in your assessment of the health of companies, reduces the downside risk. So we're not promising higher returns per se or higher yields. If we look at low yields, low spreads, your margin of error has become quite small. If you can just mitigate that type of risk, already means a lot to the investment outcome. What do you think is the one risk or the one opportunity that we should be looking out for? On the medical front, I'm concerned about the mutation of the virus and at the same time, the efficacy of the current vaccine. And on the monetary fund, um, what are we going to do with the excess liquidity that's sloshing in the market today, potentially causing inflation uh, spikes? And what 
can central banks really do if they want to continue to keep rates low? So these are some of the things that, I, that keeps me up at night. Now, we all know that Bitcoin has started to gain more acceptance in the past few months. In the years ahead, perhaps you know, when you travel to Europe or to Japan, China, you don't need to do foreign exchange. You mm -hmm. can use a central bank digital currency to pay for your travels. So, so the digital asset you know, revolution is something that's happening with or without COVID. Perhaps COVID has pushed things much faster. And I think it's important to pay close attention to that, you know, to see how that may change our investment landscape. You've had a big manufacturing recovery, whereas services have really, really lagged. And this is the exact opposite of what happened you know, um, 10 years ago during the global financial crisis. Essentially, North Asia, China, Taiwan, Korea have been the big beneficiaries, the economies, the currencies, but also the markets. Now, if we were to start seeing services meaningfully sort of coming back, coming up, coming back and, and, and recovering, now that shouldn't be bad news for North Asian equity markets. I would still expect them to do to post decent returns in absolute levels. But on a relative basis, this is where you actually could end up seeing more of services economies, you know, the ASEAN market sort of pulling up back fast. So a risk and an opportunity at the same time. The most frequently expressed concern that investors uh, have in fixed income markets is inflation picking up and on the back of that, uh, yields moving higher. This does open the uh, door to opportunities for active managers. Let me just very quickly summarize some of the key issues that we have discussed. We like Asia and China led Asia, who is first in and first out of the pandemic, is likely to continue to grow in the year going forward, particularly in the shorter term. On the fixed income space, we like corporate, particularly in the Asian space again, where it offers better yield pickup. The key risk to put, look out for clearly is a vaccine again, its efficiency and the administrative and logistical headache that it presents. Should the world continue to deteriorate, how much more stimulus and support can governments around the world provide? Last but not least, further protectionistic measures. Will China and US come at and clash again on different issues? Possibly. Maybe not now, but somewhere down the road. Well, you've heard from the experts. We thank you so much for your company. I'm Stephen Chia, and on behalf of the panel, we wish you good health and good investing. Bye for now. to you by UOB Privilege Banking.